Welcome to the UN and Organized Crime podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm Ian Tennant. This podcast episode will explore the issue of press freedom in the context of the negotiations of a new UN treaty on cybercrime. Throughout the negotiations so far, the Global Initiative has been tracking progress, providing policy inputs and facilitating engagement between negotiators and the multi-stakeholder community, both in civil society and in the private sector. The threats to digital rights, freedom of expression, and human rights more generally have long been a key point of contention in the negotiations. And all of those issues impact directly on the freedom of the press. The Global Initiative's second iteration of the Organized Crime Index, published in September 2023, has again highlighted the fundamental role of a free media in ensuring an effective understanding of and response to transnational organized crime. So any convention on cybercrime, especially at the UN level, which ramps up restrictions on the press, could also end up inhibiting efforts against cybercrime and crime more generally. In this episode, we will explore the potential impacts of the treaty on freedom of the media with an international NGO based in Vienna, the International Press Institute. I'm here in Vienna with Amy Bruyette, the Director of Advocacy at the International Press Institute. Firstly, Amy, can you describe a bit about your organization? And can you tell us why, having campaigned for press freedom in a variety of challenging countries and circumstances, that you are concerned in particular about this negotiation, given the risks and dangers that journalists already face? So the International Press Institute is a nonprofit organization based here in Vienna that promotes and advances press freedom and independent journalism globally. We monitor and document the environment for press freedom, and we look at things like direct physical attacks and threats against journalists, as well as legal attacks and threats and other types of pressures that prevent journalists from being able to do their jobs freely and safely. And we use this data as the basis for public and direct advocacy with governments and others to improve the environment for press freedom. We engage directly with governments to support the development of laws and policies that enable and promote media freedom in line with international human rights standards and norms. So you referenced this in your question, but I really want to start by emphasizing that independent journalism and journalists are under pressure in every country, in every region of the world. From physical harm to legal threats to market pressures, the work of journalists and the act of doing journalism has become increasingly more difficult and increasingly more dangerous. And one of the main trends that we're seeing is an alarming increase in the use of laws or so-called lawfare by governments around the world to punish and target journalists for any kind of reporting that could be deemed critical of those in power. So from basic reporting on public spending or public policies to bigger stories on corruption and crime, journalists today in many countries in the world are being arrested and charged under a range of very complex criminal laws, which includes cybercrime laws that prohibit the publication of content that is oftentimes protected under international human rights law. So in addition to targeting journalists and critics domestically, there's also been an alarming rise in so-called transnational repression of governments targeting journalists and critics beyond a country's borders. This type of repression can take the form of assassinations, detentions, forcible return, physical and digital harassment and threats, and targeted surveillance. So the Cybercrime Treaty, and I think we'll get more into this during this podcast, enters into the scene at a time when journalists are under siege and our media systems are extremely fragile, and in many cases, they're in crisis. So at this particular moment, what we need to do is double down on and fortify the policies and principles that guarantee press freedom and that hold states accountable for their own human rights commitments. We need strong enabling laws and policies, not policies that threaten the foundations for press freedom and the work that journalists do. Thank you, Amy. I mean, just just to be clear, you've painted a quite stark picture of the challenges and the threats that journalists already face. So 
In your view, the more you've learned about this negotiation, you feel that there is a risk that it would make things worse. Yes, very much so. I mean, for starters, the states that originally backed this treaty is enough to raise alarm bells. So the original resolution to develop the treaty was initially sponsored by Russia and then joined by Belarus, Cambodia, China, North Korea, Nicaragua, Venezuela. This is really kind of a who's who's list of despotic regimes with some of the worst records on press freedom and online censorship in the world. And these countries and many others are already abusing domestic cybercrime laws to target journalists as part of this wider pattern of so-called lawfare against the press. These laws are often enacted under the guise of combating terrorism or combating the spread of disinformation or religious hatred or, or other forms of harmful speech. But cybercrime's laws in practice have become a much abused catch-all to punish critics and journalists around the world. And it's been clear from the outset that the treaty under negotiation is really an effort by many authoritarian governments to expand their own investigatory and surveillance powers through the use of a powerful global treaty that will enable them to stamp out criticism both domestically and beyond their borders. And in fact, the treaty being negotiated could give authorities incredibly far-reaching surveillance and investigatory powers both at home and abroad, and could in essence create a kind of global surveillance dragnet that could hand repressive governments even more tools for targeting and muzzling journalists beyond their borders. And in our assessment, this treaty, at least as it's currently drafted, could not only seriously endanger and put more pressure on press freedom, but it could also even put journalist safety and security at greater risk. This has particularly alarming implications for the thousands of journalists in exile or seeking safe haven from government harassment or persecution, including journalists from China, Russia, Iran, Afghanistan, Syria, and Hong Kong. So let's get down, if we may, into the details of the draft convention. As, as we're speaking, we've only seen one draft text, which was debated at length back in August and September in New York. We are expecting a new version of that text to come out imminently, as we record the podcast today in, in late November. What we're expecting is something relatively similar to, to the last text. So could you possibly go into which provisions or articles in particular have caused you the most concern? I mean, I think really just to start with the entire premise and the spirit of the treaty causes us much concern. We've seen how cyber crimes laws and other laws are being used and abused around the world to target journalists. And we know from the drafts of this treaty that some states are trying to put into this treaty many of the same provisions that are in domestic cyber crimes laws that are already being used to, to punish journalists around the world. So really the fundamental kind of purpose and intention of the entire treaty is quite worrisome to us, given what we already know. But on a more specific level, some of our biggest concerns are the scope of the treaty, which pushes beyond cyber-dependent crimes and includes things that are so-called cyber-enabled, which really opens up a broader set of crimes that could be potentially covered under the treaty. And then another main concern is the extremely weak human rights references and safeguards, which leave so many of the powers outlined in this treaty open to abuse. And then I guess the last and most concerning aspect are the provisions around surveillance. These are really deeply concerning provisions that are especially alarming in the absence of clear and robust human rights safeguards. The current draft hand states very powerful surveillance powers, including real-time surveillance, which really poses quite serious threats to journalists and their fundamental right to privacy on which journalists rely every day to do their work. Journalists in particular rely on private communications to do their work and their reporting. Source protection, for instance, is sacrosanct for journalists. And without the expectation of privacy and of private communications, this really poses a real challenge to investigative journalism and to whistleblowing. And privacy is also, of course, about security. And the grave violations to privacy that can happen as a result of targeted surveillance, for instance, can have really grave consequences and put journalists at risk of physical harm. Remember, of course, that the murder of Jamal Khashoggi was greatly aided by surveillance. You mentioned in your answer 
earlier, the countries who proposed this treaty, of course, this process came into effect through a vote. There wasn't consensus on whether this treaty should exist or not. And we've seen through the negotiations that some countries are very strongly supporting the kind of human rights safeguards that you're talking about and, and supporting. What message would you have to those negotiators representing states who are advocating for a more human rights-based approach to ensure that they build in more effective safeguards for the media into this negotiation? I mean, I guess the main thing that we would like to express is that the entire multilateral system seems to be under great strain at this moment. And our organization and other civil society organizations, on a daily basis, we use international human rights law as the basis for our engagements with governments around the world and ways in which they can do better and to raise the standards for press freedom, especially regarding the safety of journalists. And so a treaty like this, which would really call into question some other existing principles, would really make the work of IPI and other press freedom NGOs and other civil society organizations much more difficult. So, I mean, as, as we're talking, we're, we're looking ahead to the, the apparent concluding session of the ad hoc committee, which should take place at the end of January, beginning of February 2024. I don't think any of us know exactly how things are going to play out, but if a treaty is adopted, which is as dangerous as you fear and as, as you have laid out, how will your organization respond? And what is your organization doing to advocate for a, a different outcome before we get to that? I think, first of all, we hope it won't get to that point. That's why we need to work collectively and hard now to ensure that the worst case scenario is avoided and that any text passed contains robust human rights safeguards. That's you know what we're focused on at the moment. And if the treaty is adopted without the necessary revisions to narrow the scope and to add essential human rights safeguards, we'll obviously need to mitigate the damage. We'll need to be very vigilant and closely monitor the implementation of the treaty's powers by signatory states and push back strongly against any examples of abuse by, to target journalists and to limit press freedom. You know, bad laws do get passed and our job in these circumstances is to be a watchdog over their implementation and to defend journalists from the damage that they can cause. But we want to also keep in mind that this is not just any bad law. It's really... This is a global treaty that would legitimize a wide host of repressive tactics to punish and suppress dissent. So its potential damage is quite immense. And let's also remember that a huge threat from this treaty is not just its implementation per se, but its potential to lead to self-censorship, particularly among members of exile journalists who are fleeing authoritarian regimes. And just as a, a, a final question, there is a a line of argument that I've heard, which is, okay, there are, there are countries that have bad cybercrime repressive laws that may cooperate with each other anyway. What does this treaty change if they're already cooperating or sharing evidence, for example, with each other? I think the treaty would still be quite dangerous in the sense that it legitimizes these types of behaviors. And it would also potentially require democratic states, so to speak, to aid repressive states in their investigations, cross-border investigations of journalists and critics around the world. Amy Bruyette, thank you very much for joining our podcast episode today. During this episode, we've heard about what harms the treaty could have on the freedom of the press. And the details are scary and stark, to say the least. With only a few weeks to go until the concluding session of the ad hoc committee, time is running low for delegates to find a compromise. Unfortunately, it is still possible that a compromise could be reached that would have a major chilling and damaging effect on the freedom of the media and therefore have a damaging effect on our efforts to counter cybercrime and transnational organized crime more generally. As we've done throughout the lifetime of the Ad Hoc Committee, we will continue monitoring and engaging with the process through further episodes of this podcast series and through other publications which are available and will be available on our websites, globalinitiative.net 
You've been listening to the UN and Organized Crime podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Mm-hmm.